Very happy to have the opportunity to come and tell you about some of the things we've been up to the, the last few years. I'd like to start off with this slide because what we've been trying to explain in the last few years is why it is that Oscar Wilde has such difficulty resisting temptation. Uh, and to some extent, this, since this is a William James lecture, uh, William James, of course, had something to say about everything, including this. Now, in this case, he's talking about the temptations afforded by alcohol. He's referring to the drunken Rip Van Winkle, but we can just sort of generalize here. And he's pointing out that with each use of alcohol, there's some sort of counting that's taking place. That is, the counting down amongst the nerve cells and fibers that are registering it, storing it, uh, storing it up to be used against him when the next temptation comes. And to some extent, that's what we're trying to understand. That is, how these temptations may be used against you as a consequence of various kinds of experiences with drugs as, and with other rewards. Now, of course, temptations typically take the form of cues that are associated with rewards. And if we had eye trackers on all you, we could track your eyes and see where exactly your eyes go, which would be indication of you picking your own poison, in a sense, amongst these various cues. But cues, that is the sights, sounds, and smells, and places that are associated with rewards, really can only acquire enormous control over behavior and potentially tempt uh, maladaptive behavior if they acquire the ability to act as incentive stimuli. And what I mean by incentive stimuli is just what the dictionary means. That is, they're stimuli that arouse feelings, incites us to actions, they're exciting cause, they spur and motivate and uh, serve as uh, uh, to provoke us into action. So you can ask, how is it that you can tell whether a cue that's predictive of award, that is a perfectly good informational conditional stimulus in the case of Pavlovian conditioning, capable of evoking a conditioned response, a CR, how do you tell if such a cue also has these incentive stimulus properties that attract, incite, provoke, and goad us and tempt us to action? And one way you can tell is to ask whether or not the cue has acquired what's known as Pavlovian incentive motivational properties. Now, of course, everyone knows the basics of Pavlovian conditioning where, you know, cues, I can't point, <laughs> it's way over there, cues that CSs that have been paired with unconditional stimuli will eventually come to be able to evoke uh, responses, conditioned responses that previously have been evoked just by the unconditional stimulus. That is, cues have this predictive value. But the situation is much more complicated than that, and one reason for that is that CSs can also influence behavior because they have the ability to directly activate very complex emotional and motivational states. That is, in addition to having predictive value, they have what's referred to as Pavlovian incentive value. Now, if reward-associated cues acquire Pavlovian incentive motivational properties, that is, in the terminology my colleague Kent Berridge, they become attributed with incentive salience, they acquire three fundamental properties, which are the defining features of an incentive stimulus. Incentive stimuli, oops, incentive stimuli, for one, bias your attention towards them and can elicit approach behavior into close proximity with them. Uh, and you can measure that by looking at Pavlovian conditioned approach behavior or attentional bias in humans, for example. Uh, they are also themselves desired in the sense that animals will learn new instrumental actions to get them. That is, they act as condition reinforcers. They'll work just to get the cue, independent of the, the actual reward. And lastly, they can evoke conditioned motivational states that can spur actions uh, to get the associated word, uh, the associated reward. That is, they may energize ongoing instrumental actions, or they can instigate new drug-seeking or reward-seeking actions. And that kind of effect is usually uh, measured in the animal literature by what are so-called Pavlovian instrumental transfer effects or, or reinstatement kinds of procedures. So collectively, these three features of incentive stimuli are the defining characteristics of an incentive stimuli. Uh, and in this particular uh, example, uh, Milton and Everett have, in the context of drugs, suggested that these act as three different routes to relapse. And the main point to make here 
is that these three properties of an incentive stimulus, although collectively defining an incentive stimulus, are themselves psychologically and neurobiologically dissociable. Now, I always tell Barry Everett that I take one, uh, I, I, one problem with this particular side, is that they're suggesting that these are the th properties of a condition stimulus. Notice that the slide says CS. And in fact, it shouldn't say that. It should say incentive stimulus. These are the properties of an incentive stimulus, but not necessarily a condition stimulus. And that's because it turns out there's enormous individual variation in the extent to which reward cues, conditional stimuli, are attributed with Pavlovian incentive motivational properties, that is, incentive salience. And it also turns out, and what I'll be showing you as data uh, to, to suggest this, is that then predictors, that is CSs, do not necessarily also acquire the ability to act as incentive stimuli. It's, a po it's possible to dissociate the predictive from the motivational value of cues, and in particular through studying uh, individual differences. So I'm first going to talk about food cues before I talk about drug cues. And again, the main point here is to show you some data to suggest that there's enormous individual variation in the extent to which food cues are in fact attributed with motivational value. And we can look at each of the features of an incentive stimulus starting with conditioned approach behavior. Now, if you're interested in conditioned approach behavior, that is the, the extent to which in animals incentive stimuli will bias attention to them and elicit uh, a, a, a attraction into close proximity with them, the classic procedure to look at that is to look to see whether animals develop what's been called a sign tracking CR. And this refers to the fact that when animals learn a CS-US association, the CS itself will sometimes become attractive. And in the old literature, the CS was called the sign, the sign for signaling uh, uh, reward, in this case, food reward. And so learning the CS-US association results in this cue itself becoming attractive and listening eliciting an approach into close proximity with it. And the one way to do that in our standard procedure for doing that is using this regular Pavlovian so-called auto-shaping procedure. The CS here is a lever. I'm going to point way over here. The lever comes into the cage for eight seconds. The lever then is retracted, and as soon as it's retracted, a food pellet is delivered into the food well. And this is just happening in the animal's world. It's lever, eight seconds later, food. Lever, food, lever, food. The animal doesn't have to do anything. It's going to get the food no matter what. There's no response being reinforced. But it turns out animals do do things. And some animals do some things, and other animals do other things. Now, a lot of animals do develop that sign tracking CR that I referred to. And so if you look here in the black, uh, what we're, what's shown here is an increasing probability with training, an increasing probability of approaching the lever during that eight second CS period. Uh, they engage it more and more vigorously and what they're doing is biting and chewing on it and they approach it faster and faster and faster. And so these animals in the black are developing this classic sign tracking CR. As they learn the CS-US association, the cue itself becomes an incentive action object that attracts the animals to it. But it's always been noted in this literature that there's huge individual variation in the extent to which animals will acquire this sign tracking CR. And you can see here we've broken the population into thirds, and there's animals in the white down here that simply do not learn a sign tracking CR. Uh, there's other animals that are in the middle, the intermediates, that I'll come back to. But with these animals that don't learn the sign tracking CR, there's a number of reasons that might be, and one of them, of course, is that they're simply not learning the CS-US association, and what you're looking at is a difference in Pavlovian learning ability. But it turns out that that's not the case. They're learning perfectly well. They're just learning a different CR. They're learning what Bokes in 1977 called a goal tracking CR. That is, with experience, there's an increasing probability of them approaching the food cup during that CS period. They engage the food cup more and more vigorously, and they approach it faster and faster and faster. So they're learning the CS-US association. They're just not directing the behavior to the CS itself. They're directing their behavior to the place where food eventually is going to be delivered. And so Bokes called this a goal tracking CR. Now the important point I want to make here is that both sign trackers and goal trackers are acquiring 
their respective CRs at exactly the same rate. They're learning exactly the same. But the CS is having different effects on performance in different animals. In some animals, the CS itself is becoming attractive, and in other animals, the CS is triggering anticipatory behavior directed towards the food cup. Uh, so you can say that only in some animals is the CS acquiring one feature of an incentive stimulus, that is its ability to attract animals to it. So to, just to show you what this looks like, here's a little movie that was made by Ben Saunders, a former student in the lab, and you'll see a lever appear here. There's the lever, and this animal's paying a lot of attention to that lever. Remember, the food doesn't come until the lever's retracted. And you'll see, now, bam, it gets the food. Now the next animal, you watch for the lever to appear. There's the lever. It glances at the lever, but its behavior is all focused on the food cup. And that's what's called a goal tracking CR. You can see the behavior is very, very similar in the animals. They're both learning a Pavlovian conditioned approach response. It's just directed to do different places in the world, to the CS itself or to the place where food will eventually be delivered. Now, some animals are ambivalent. That is, on one trial they show sign tracking, in other trials they show goal tracking. These are the so-called intermediate animals. And Shelley gave me this, uh, what, what, uh, this slide of what she called an ultimate intermediate. It's got its paw in the food cup and its, uh, its paw on the lever and its nose in the food cup. I mean, this is a truly ambivalent animal. I'm going to show you one more movie because this movie really illustrates the, extents to the extent to which these Pavlovian reward cues can become really irresistibly attractive. They become so attractive they lead to what is, looks like irrational behavior and loss of the reward. In this situation, the food's being delivered down here in the right, but a light comes on to the left. Now, the animal's going up and pecking the light. The food's not going to come until the light goes off. The animal does not have to go to that light. There's no reason to do that. The food's going to be delivered as soon as the light goes off. And you can set up the situation such that if it does go up to the light, the food's only available for a limited period of time, and it'll lose the food. But it still does it. And this is what I mean by reward cues becoming irresistibly attractive. They attract the animals attention and behavior directed towards it to such an extent that they actually lose the reward, which is also evidence, of course, that this behavior is not being maintained by some sort of superstitious behavior, advantageous reinforcement. And there's lots of studies using emission schedules to show that. Now, this phenomena, this goal tracking, sign tracking phenomena, has been around for a long time. And I like to show this slide, particularly for students, to emphasize if you want new ideas, read the old literature to paraphrase Pavlov here. And that's because this basic phenomenon was described by Zenner in 1937. And he's basically doing Pavlov's experiments. That is, a bell rings and then food's delivered. A bell rings and then food's delivered. But instead of measuring salivation, like Pavlov did, the animals were free to move around. And what he found was is that some dogs responded to the CS by making a small but definite movement of approach to the condition stimulus, to the bell. That's a description of what later became called sign tracking 30 years before the discovery of sign tracking. But then he said other dogs made an initial glance at the bell, but that was then followed by constant fixation at the food pan. That's a description of what be called, became called goal tracking 40 years before Bokes termed the, the phrase goal tracking, describing this. And then he describes these ambivalent animals that are doing one and then the other, one and then the other, that vacillate back and forth. Uh, so the, the phenomenon has been around for a very long time, but no one really picked up on the, what's going on, what's, what are the reasons for this kind of individual variation in the attractiveness of a reward cue. We actually even went back, since uh, Zenner had said in the dogs that the goal trackers initially glanced at the bell and then went to the food cup, and indeed that's exactly what the rats are doing too. That is, this just shows the distinction between the sign tracking and goal tracking approach CRs, where one is a perfect sign tracker, minus one is a perfect goal tracker, and zero is a perfectly ambivalent animal that does one or the other 50% of the time. But if you look at a different CR, conditioned approach, that is, does the animal make a head and body movement in the direction of the CR, or the CS, I mean, uh, both sign trackers and goal trackers learn a condition oriented response. What happens is sign trackers orient to the CS and then are attracted in close proximity to it, 
Goal trackers, when the CS comes on, glance at it and then go to the food cup. But they show this acquired conditioned oriented response. Um, so this, and I'm coming, the reason I'm emphasizing this condition orientation right now is that I'll come back to that in a sec. So that's looking at one feature of a CS, the ability to, to uh, attract animals to it. Uh, let's look at the next, that is the ability of CSs to act as condition reinforcers. And you can do this by asking now, after the animals have learned what I, this procedure I just showed you, is will they work now just to get the lever CS? That is, is the lever CS sufficient to act as a condition reinforcer? And how effective is it as a condition reinforcer in sign trackers and growl trackers? And we've done this study many different ways now, and basically the bottom line is, is that the CS is a much more effective condition reinforcer in sign trackers, they'll work for it, than in goal trackers, they won't work very avidly for it. And you can see that looking at it a number of different ways. Uh, the other thing to look at then is the ability of the CS to evoke a conditioned motivational state and reinstate seeking kinds of behaviors. Uh, Lindsay Yeager in the lab looked at that. You train an animal on an instrumental task, extinguish the behavior, and then see whether the cue will reinstate behavior. And what we find is a food cue reinstates instrumental responding to a greater extent in sign trackers than in goal trackers. In sign trackers than in goal trackers. So looking at all different, all three features of an incentive stimulus, we find basically the same answer. That is, it appears that a food cue is more attractive, it's more wanted or desired in, this, in, this, in the extent to which animals will work for it, and it's a more effective instigator of actions in sign trackers than in goal trackers. So the cue is an equally effective predictive conditional stimulus, evoking a CR in both sign trackers and goal trackers, they both learn about the CSUS association, but it seems to act as a really effective incentive stimulus only in some animals, that is, in the sign trackers. Now, in most studies on learning, uh, in Pavlovian learning, for example, the predictive value of cues and the incentive value of cues are completely confounded because they tend to change together. They're learned together and they tend to change together. But this individual variation in the propensity to attribute incentive salience to food cues provides a way to parse apart, if you will, the predictive or informational value of cues from their incentive value and start to dissect which neural systems are involved in one versus the other. Now, of course, there's a lot of interest in the role of dopamine in learning these days. And so in this particular paper, uh, which most of the work was done by Shelley Flagel and Jeremy Clark uh, working in Paul Phillips' lab, we ask about the role of dopamine in learning, sign tracking versus goal tracking CRs. So just to orient you a little bit for that, of course, most people know the classic work, uh, work of Wolfram Schultz, where he's recording from dopamine neurons in monkeys. And prior to learning, dopamine neurons fire in response to receipt of unexpected rewards, in this case, a food reward. However, after learning, when you have a CS now that predicts the food reward, dopamine neurons fire to the cue and not to receipt of the reward, okay? And this is the kind of evidence, there's tons of studies like this, that's the classic evidence that have led to people, including Wolfram, to suggest that dopamine's providing some sort of prediction error signal, which is part of most theoretical models of learning, a prediction error signal that's necessary for learning. Um, however, in all of those kinds of studies, as I said, the predictive value of the Q and the incentive value of the Q are confounded. But the information that I've just given you on individual differences provides us with a way to separate those. Because the lever CS is an equally effective predictor in sign trackers and goal trackers, and both learn that CS-US association. They both learn a Pavlovian CR. But the CS is an effective incentive stimulus only in the sign trackers. Now, if these phasic dopamine signals that I just, for example, the ones that I just mentioned by Schultz, are associated with the action of the CS as a predictor necessary for learning, then the CS should evoke a dopamine signal both in sign trackers and goal trackers because they both learn perfectly well. However, if the dopamine signals related to the incentive properties of the CS, you'd expect to see a phasic dopamine signal preferentially in the sign trackers relative to the goal trackers. And that's what was done in this paper. I'm just going to go through it very, very quickly. We're not recording dopamine neurons with electrophysiological techniques, but this is in vivo voltometry in the accumbens 
And so it's measuring dopamine release up in the accumbens. And if you look at the top up here, these are the sign trackers. So this is the dopamine signal to the CS and the US on the first day of training and then across six successive days of training. And basically what you see is exactly what Schultz says you should see. That is, with experience, you lose the dopamine response to the US and you gain it to the CS. And you get what looks like this dopamine prediction error signal. However, if you look at the goal trackers, you see absolutely no evidence for a dopamine prediction error signal. Uh, even though, remember, they're learning perfectly well. They're learning their CS-US association and they're learning a goal tracking CR. So the, there does not appear to be a dopamine dependent or a dopamine prediction error signal in goal trackers, although there does appear to be something like that in sign trackers, but I'll argue that, that even that's not related to learning in a second. The other thing that Shelley did was to give animals a dopamine antagonist during learning this, this uh, procedure. And without going into the data, long story short, if you give a dopamine antagonist, you block the learning of a sign tracking CR, but you have no effect whatsoever on the learning of a goal tracking CR. One's dopamine dependent, one is not dopamine dependent. Ben Saunders, when he's in the lab, did the experiment looking at performance. So now you train the animals to asymptote, and he's going to put flupenthixol, the dopamine antagonist, into the accumbens prior to a test session to look at whether or not you can degrade performance of one versus the other. And what you can see is a nice dose-dependent reduction in the performance of a sign tracking CR, no change whatsoever in the performance of a goal tracking CR. Again, one appears to be dopamine dependent and the other's dopamine independent. If they're dependent on different neurobiological systems, you can be pretty sure that they're being mediated by different psychological mechanisms as well. Ben went on to look at a couple of other things, though, and this goes back to this condition orienting CR. The, uh, what's shown here is just two different measures of approach, and what you see is dopamine blockade decreases approach behavior. However, it has no effect whatsoever on condition orienting responses. And that's important because it suggests that dopamine blockade is not blocking all CRs. It doesn't seem to be blocking approach necessarily because it blocks the CSUS association. It's influencing performance of the CR, but not necessarily degrading the CSUS association. The other thing that Ben did was look after dopamine blockade on the very, very first trial. No new learning can have taken place on the first trial. And what you see, nevertheless, is degraded performance on the very first trial. And this is suggesting, of course, that dopamine blockade is not suppressing the expression even of a sign tracking CR because it's resulting in some sort of negative prediction error signal, thus changing the learned value of the cue. It's doing it in some different way. And so in interpreting these data, I just like to remind people using this quote from uh, Mark Bowden, a learning theorist in Vermont, who points out what we all should remember and that learning is not the same as performance. You can't measure learning. All you can ever measure is performance. Learning is an inferred psychological construct, and you infer changes in learning based on changes in performance. But lots of things change performance besides learning per se. And as he points out here, you know, learning's not the same as performance. For learning to be translated into performance requires motivation. And it's because of that to a large extent that these processes tend to be so intertwined that they can be confused often. And I think the prediction error signal story is a confusion. And so our argument is that dopamine antagonism is attenuating the performance specifically of a sign tracking CR because it's degrading the motivational properties of the CS. And those properties are required for the CS to be attractive, that is for it to influence performance but without necessarily degrading the CSUS association. That is, the influence of dopamine blockade in this case is on performance, but not on learning per se. So what I've told you so far is I, we think that we have two phenotypes. We call them sign trackers and goal trackers for lack of a better term, but sign trackers is shorthand for animals that are prone to attribute incentive salience to reward cues, and goal trackers is shorthand for animals that are less prone to attribute incentive salience to reward cues. But it's not based just on the sign tracking and goal tracking CRs. It's based on a variety of different measures. And so we think the phenotype's not sign tracking and goal tracking, but the propensity to attribute motivational value to cues. Now, we've looked at this phenotype in a lot of animals now. And this is over 4,000 animals. Uh, so you can actually get some idea of the proportion in the population. Um, 
Now, the cutoff on what you call a sign tracker and a goal tracker is somewhat arbitrary, but if we use a cutoff so that you're doing one twice as often as the other, which is 0.5 on this, on this scale, then it, the population breaks down about one-third, one-third, and one-third intermediates. So sign tracking and goal tracking represent a lot of the population. Now, what makes you a sign tracker and a goal versus a goal tracker, we really don't know. We think genetic factors are important, and that comes from studies using selectively bred lines of rats that I, can't, uh, I don't have time to tell you about, but also from the fact that when we look at where the rats come from, what supplier or what colony from the same supplier, you get very, very significant differences in the proportion of one versus the other. That's not proof of a genetic factor, but it's suggestive of something going on in terms of genetics. And we're now starting to really look at the genetics in a much more uh, comprehensive way in, collabor in collaboration with Abe Palmer, who's a behavioral geneticist at the University of Chicago. So we think genetic factors are important, but with any complex psychological trait, you can know it's going to be due to gene environment interactions, and we think that's the case here. We know that environmental factors are important, and they come from these kinds of studies. If you look at animals, for example, reared without mothers, and this is so-called motherless rearing is an example of early life adversity. Uh, animals reared without mothers, you shift the population towards, goal tra or towards sign tracking. Okay? If you give them tactile stimulation every day by painting them with a paintbrush, you mitigate that effect to some extent. Uh, Mike Bargo has done sort of the reverse experiment. If you rear rats in an enriched environment, you shift the whole population towards goal tracking. So early life events can bias the population one way or the other. And as I said, I'm sure what's going to be the case is that they're complex gene by environment interactions that determines the phenotype, but we'll see. Okay, so that's food cues so far. I wanna move on now to talk about drug cues. Much of the research in our lab is related to the psychology and neurobiology of addiction, and so we can ask a very simple question. Does variation in the propensity to attribute incentive salience to a food cue, a localizable food cue, predict the extent to which drug-associated cues will acquire incentive salience? And again, we can just walk through each of the features of an incentive stimulus, first looking at conditioned approach. But now, instead of approach to a cue that predicts food reward, this is approach to a cue, in this case, that predicts cocaine reward. And so now what's going on is that the CS is a light, and then at the same time, the animal's given an intravenous injection of cocaine. And then at some time, some variable interval, it's light cocaine. So again, it's light cocaine, light cocaine. It's Pavlovian, it's not self-administration, no response reinforcement, it's just pure Pavlovian conditioning. And the question in this case then is the, to what extent does the light become attractive in sign trackers versus goal trackers based on whether they will rear up into close proximity to it, that is, start to investigate it. And Lindsay Yeager in the lab has looked at that, and indeed what she finds is that you get much better conditioned approach behavior to the cocaine cue now in sign trackers than in goal trackers. Now, one problem with using a drug as the U.S. is, of course, you can't look at goal tracking. There's no goal to approach. The drug's given intravenously, and it's inside your body. And so one reason the goal trackers may not be approaching here, again, could be a learning explanation. They're just simply not learning the CSUS association as well. And again, this is where this, looking at a different CR, conditioned approach in this, or conditioned orientation in the case, becomes handy because they are learning the CSUS association if you look at a different CR, conditioned orientation. Both sign trackers and goal trackers learn to orient to the cue, but it becomes attractive drawing only sign trackers into close proximity with it. We've done a similar experiment now looking at another drug. Is this just specific to cocaine? This is using remifentanil, which is a, a very potent mu mu opioid receptor agonist, it's avidly self-administered, it's very advantageous for learning studies, and that's because it has a very short half-life. This is the dopamine response to different doses of remifentanil, and you can see even with the highest dose, it's all over in one to two minutes. So this is a very, very short-acting drug, which allows you to do lots of CSUS pairings, which is very difficult with drugs that have long half-lives. And, and basically, using Remy, you see the same kind of thing we saw with cocaine, both sign trackers and goal trackers learn a condition uh, orienting response, but you get much more avid approach in sign trackers than you do in goal trackers. In all of these experiments, they're unpaired control animals. Unpaired control animals don't, aren't learning 
uh, either of the CRs. So that's, uh, that's conditioned approach. What about condition reinforcement? You can ask now whether animals will work for a drug cue. And so this is an experiment. It's actually in a self-administration kind of procedure, but the Pavlovian uh, training takes place in separate Pavlovian sessions. You extinguish the instrumental response, then you ask whether they'll work for the cue that they've never worked before, for, for before because they learned about its incentive value in a Pavlovian session. And what you find is that a Pavlovian cocaine cue is a more effective condition reinforcer in sign trackers and in goal trackers. We get the same kind of thing with an opioid cue. Remifentanil cue is a more potent uh, uh, condition reinforcer in sign trackers than in goal trackers. The last thing uh, to look at then is the extent to which the, a drug cue will evoke a condition motivational state. And that was done by Ben Saunders, who's sitting down here uh, before he left the lab. And the procedure he uses for this is quite different than what's typically done in, in drug reinstatement kinds of, of tests, which typically are tests of condition reinforcement, not condition motivation. Uh, and it doesn't involve extinction training as well, which is advantageous. So basically, animals are trained in all the far left over here to self-administer cocaine as usual. In this case, they make a nose poke, they get drug, and a light turns on. So the light in the nose port is the cocaine cue. And so they learn to self-administer to get the drug in the light. Then you electrify the front two-thirds of the chamber. They can, the drug is still there, they can take drug, except to get it now, they have to cross this electrified chamber to make the response to get the cocaine. And you start off with a very low current, so they'll cross and they'll continue to take cocaine. But each day you turn the current up a little bit more and a little bit more, and eventually they say, screw that, it's not worth it anymore. And so what you have now is the animals becoming abstinent because of the adverse consequences of continuing to take the drug. The drug's always available. On the crucial test day, what happens then is the floor is still electrified, but now you non-contingently just flash the light periodically to see whether the light will goad them, if you will, to cross the electrified grid and nose poke. Okay? That is, to what extent will the cue create this motivational state that leads to uh, drug-seeking behavior even in the face of the continued adverse consequence? And what been found was, as you would expect, as the current increases, animals indeed stop self-administering, they become abstinent, and there's no difference between sign trackers and goal trackers and intermediates in the current required to achieve abstinence. However, on the reinstatement test day, what you find is, is that you get much better reinstatement behavior in sign trackers here than in goal trackers, and there's a positive correlation in, on, along that PCA scale. And so a cocaine cue is causing relapse, if you will, by generation of this condition motivational state to a greater extent in sign trackers than in goal trackers. So one thing that's interesting about this, if you think about it for a sec, is that it's possible to predict prior to any exposure to drug, based on the propensity to attribute incentive salience to a food cue, which animal is going to be more prone to relapse when later in its life it's exposed to drug. Now, of course, there's a lot of interest in the neural systems that are engaged by reward cues and are potentially involved in relapse, both in humans and animals. And one region in the brain that a lot of studies have focused on, of course, is this ventral striatum, as well as other associated regions. And this is just showing that cues associated with uh, nicotine, alcohol, and cocaine tend to activate this, these so-called brain motive circuits, including the ventral striatum. I like to mention Anna Rose Childress's study uh, here because what it shows is that you don't actually have to be consciously aware of the cues for the cues to engage these brain motive circuits. She's using very rapid presentation of cues in a masking procedure so that the cues themselves are unseen. People are unconsciously aware of seeing the cues, but both cocaine cues and sexual cues activate these systems in the absence of any conscious awareness of, of the cues themselves. Now, in animal models, the way to look at this kind of thing is rather than doing imaging sorts of studies is that you can look at immediate early gene expression in CFOS. Uh, in this first study uh, that uh, Shelley did, she's looking at the, what happens if you expose animals to a, a, a food cue in that, that came from that Pavlovian situation that I, I've already described. Uh, and what she found was is that the food cue in, would induce CFOS mRNA in sign trackers, both in the dorsal and ventral striatum, in sign trackers, but not in goal trackers, relative to an unpaired control group. And what that's telling you is the predictive value of the cue 
is not sufficient to engage this circuitry. The Q has to have incentive value as well to engage this circuitry. Uh, Lindsay uh, Yeager has expanded these data. First, she replicated the food queue effects, again, primarily in sign trackers, not in goal trackers, and shows it generalizes to a drug queue as well, in this case, Remy Fentanyl. What, what these kinds of data are suggesting is regions like the striatum aren't particularly interested in prediction. They're interested in motivation. And it's only if the queues have motivational value do you really engage these circuits. Predictive value is not sufficient. So, we can sum up fairly easily here, and this has been the story that we've been touting for the last few years, uh, and I haven't told you about all the data. We've, we've looked at this in many different ways using many different procedures, but basically the story is, is that it seems that some individuals, the sign trackers, are especially prone to attribute incentive salience to reward cues. So it doesn't take that much imagination to suggest that in such individuals, reward cues are going to become potentially maladaptively attractive wanted and will spur behavior to obtain the associated reward. And so obviously this could be a risk factor for a variety of impulse control disorders such as addiction. Easy way to, to, to think about it is sign trackers are going to be animals that are more prone to addiction. That was a nice story. We should have stopped there. But then we did one more experiment and it changes everything around. That is we considered one more cue that we know is critical for relapse in addicts, and these data aren't published yet. And that cue is context. Context, contextual cues are very, very important for relapse in addicts. Addicts tend to relapse if they go back to places where they used to use drugs, like bars if you're an alcoholic. Don't do that. Bad thing to do if you don't want to relapse. And Ben, before he left the lab, and the paper's not out yet because he sat on it too damn long, uh, looked now at context-induced relapse and using what's called an ABA design. In this, you train animals to self-administer cocaine in context A, and then you extinguish them either in context A or context B. On the reinstatement test day, the animals that were extinguished in context A, that's just another extinction session. The ones that are extinguished in context B now come back to the context where previously they had experienced drug. And you look to see what happens in terms of renewing seeking behavior. And what we found was, is you get much better context reinstatement in the goal trackers than in the sign trackers. Exactly the opposite of anything we've ever seen with discrete cues. Uh, ben replicated that, so the replication is in the arrows here, but also showed that the context renewal was dopamine dependent. That is, flupenthixol into the core of the accumbens attenuated context renewal behavior. So now we have to add context into this table. And if you add context into the table, the story now sort of becomes, it looks like discrete or localizable or manipulable. There's a number of features of these discrete cues that I'm calling discrete cues, and we're not sure which are the most critical features, but discrete localizable cues and interoceptive cues, I didn't tell you that story, but drug interoceptive cues, seem to acquire greater control over motivated behavior in sign trackers than in goal trackers. But context cues, seem to exert greater control over motivated behavior in goal trackers than in sign trackers. And so just to summarize, it appears that, in, that individuals that are prone to attribute incentive salience reward cues will have particular difficulty resisting them. I mean, that I, I think is true. And it's going to be those individuals in which reward cues become maladaptively attractive and wanted that will then spur behavior to obtain the associated reward. And when combined with uh, poor inhibitory control over behavior, which I haven't had time to talk about, we think this is what's going to promote excessive consumption. Uh, that could be for food, it could be for drugs, it could be for whatever your particular poison is. Uh, but the propensity to attribute a lot of motivational value to particular classes of cues may then confer vulnerability uh, for these kinds of impulse control disorders. And so, the, the way that we're thinking about this now is that different individuals may in fact be sensitive to different triggers of relapse in the context of drugs at least. That is, different triggers may motivate behavior and produce relapse differentially in different individuals. So sign trackers and goal trackers may process motivationally salient information in quite different ways, uh, but they may both be susceptible to addiction, 
but it may be that they actually follow somewhat different pathways to addiction. They have these different vulnerabilities in terms of what cues capture their attention and motivate their behavior. And to the extent that that turns out to be true in people, of course, that's going to be very important in developing individualized treatment approaches that really, that really uh, tap into individual vulnerabilities. So if we go back to uh, Oscar Wilde, uh, who had, his, had difficulty resisting temptation, we're just starting to get a handle, we think, on some of, the, some of the features that confer this kind of vulnerability to temptation. Although a century or two before, William Blake had a sort of an answer. He points out that those who restrain desire do so because theirs is weak enough to be restrained. And we're trying to understand what it is con that confers this weakness, if you will, in different individuals and to which classes of drug cues. Now, I've tried to mention as I went along the people who have done the work in, in my lab and in Shelley's lab uh, and with other collaborators. Uh, but since this is the Lifetime Achievement Award, it, it behooves me to point out that a lifetime achievement takes a lot of help. And I can't possibly mention all the people that I've worked with over the years. But I do want to highlight eight individuals that I need to give thanks for uh, over the lifetime. One is Ian Wishaw. I started working with Ian as an undergraduate, and it's what got me into this business as a third year undergraduate, and we've stayed good friends and collaborators ever since. I'd like to thank Elliot Valenstein, because, well, one, Elliot hired me, in a sense. He was chair of the area at the time, and early in my career was just incredibly, incredibly generous in terms of resources and advice and good advice and so on. Uh, Jill Becker and I collaborated for many years on a lot of experiments having to do with sensitization, and Jill taught me all about neurochemistry, which I didn't know anything about. I've also collaborated over the years with Kent Berridge, and uh, Kent and I have, uh, have uh, published a number of uh, theoretical articles, and Kent basically taught me everything I knew about motivated behavior. I didn't start out doing this kind of stuff at all. Uh, Huda Akil, who's at the University of Michigan, uh, was really helpful as a collaborator when we started getting in and looking at gene expression kinds of things and took me a little bit into the world of molecular biology. Uh, Aldo Badiani was a postdoc with me for, for six years. He's now a professor at the University of Rome and uh, initiated a whole series of studies having to do with the role of context, which we sort of drifted away from but are clearly coming back to now. And uh, Brian Kolb, uh, was involved in uh, collaborating with a whole series of studies I haven't talked about at all here, having to do with structural plasticity, that is how drugs produce actual structural changes in, in brain neurons. And finally, Shelley Flagel, who's sitting down the front here, who really sort of set us on this road to look at individual differences when we first noticed these strange individual differences. You have to, in behavioral neuroscience, of course, what you're trying to do is get rid of all of the individual differences. And we came to realize that actually that's was the most interesting thing, and that led us down this journey to explore this. And then the only last slide I have is one that's a warning to all students, and this is really the consequences of studying anything for a long time. This is what happens to you, uh, so think twice. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, in self-regulation we have this um, um, construal level where we have people who think more abstractly and people who think more concretely and this is individual difference or contextual. Is there any overlap or, because that reminds me a lot and we also know that the, at the low construal level you're you know, more prone to temptations, you have less ability to self-regulate behavior. Um, this sounds very much like construal yeah. type yeah. of in, you know, sure. higher yeah. order. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's a very good question. So, I mean, in a broad sense, the question is, what is it that's really psychologically different between these animals? And to some extent, we don't really know yet. But I do tend to think of them as personality differences. Now, how they got to be there that way and what the true nature of the difference is, I don't know. I have a fairly good idea what's going on with the sign trackers. It's the goal trackers that are actually harder to understand in terms of what psychological process is governing their behavior. Um, I mentioned the other day that I've just been reading Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, and you can see actually a lot of parallels there in terms of system one and system two and which one is really grabbing a hold of you. Uh, and there may be some parallels there. So I, it's going to take us some time to figure out uh, you know, what kinds of strategies these animals are actually using to make sense of their world. I think they are using different strategies, uh, but exactly what those are, you can draw lots of parallels fairly easily. Uh, proving them is a different thing altogether. <laughs>
Great, wonderful talk and work. Um, I have actually two questions. The one is, if you see a, a distribution like there, actually, with the sign trackers and the gold trackers, um, you expect that probably there's some evolutionary benefit to both. So in most of the talk, the sign trackers do really poor in all of this work. So do you have any idea on yeah. what could be the benefit? Yeah, so the great thing about evolutionary questions is that you can make up any story you want and right. no one can prove you wrong. I'm sure you have your story. <laughs> <laughs> and, and a lot of people tend to jump on the sign trackers and want to think of the sign trackers as stupid. I don't think that's the case oh. at all. If you're out wandering around the jungle, the animal that goes quickly to the sign that predicts the food is going to get it more often. Right. But sometimes they're going to get eaten by okay. acting too quickly. And so I think of these as two different strategies. Both are probably adaptive right. and they're maintained in the population because they're both adaptive. Yeah. And in the population you want to have yeah. both. So the second question is also relating to the human stuff. Um, as you know, we can show the approach bias, but that's yeah. to, condition, to cues relating to a drug. And actually, in, for example, alcoholics, you see that about half of them have this strong approach bias and are sensitive to this type of uh, training, but the other half just doesn't have it. Yeah. So I'm wondering, is there a possible test where you have more the pure goal tracking, sign tracking in humans without the cues that have already been conditioned. Yeah, so yeah, people who do human research often ask that kind of question. I think the, the entire attentional bias literature, to some extent, is capturing the sign, the, the sign tracking phenotype. Yeah. The hard thing is, what, what is the goal tracking phenotype? And as I said, we're not sure psychologically what's going on there. I have my hypotheses. I think I know what's going on in goal trackers, but I don't have any evidence for it. I think what's going on in goal trackers is that the cue creates a much more cognitive expectation and reward. Mm -hmm. And so it's a much more cognitive kind of processes. And based on the animal learning literature, to the extent that behavior is being governed by explicit represent right. declarative representations, that should not be dopamine dependent. So I think something like that's going on. And so now how you capture that psychological strategy, if you will, in humans to separate those that show the attentional mm -hmm. bias versus those that don't, I'm not sure, but I think it's going to be something like that. Right. And I, I haven't seen it. I mean, uh, Andreas Heinz in, in Berlin, for example, is trying to do this with pit, but it's a mm -hmm. pit kind of procedure in humans. And again, you've got really high pit people and yep. low pit people. And I think, there's, I think it's there. It's, someone has to be really imaginative to figure out how to distinguish the, the cognitive styles, if you will. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much.